Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We are just back from our live show at Adams National Historical Park in Quincy, Massachusetts. Yeah, it was super delightful. We had a great time. We had a great crowd. Everybody was awesome and delightful. The park staff was awesome and delightful. The technology was less awesome and delightful. Not on their part. No. Going to tell the whole story of what happened with the technology (laughs) at the end of the show because it is kind of eerie and weird. So I think folks might be interested to hear what happened with the technology. But it's also a bit of a longer story, so I didn't want to put it at the top of the show. Just say our apologies that we, rather than having the live recording, we are going to have a studio version of our show that we did at Adams National Historical Park, which was called John Quincy and Louisa Catherine Adams Abroad. (laughs) Yes. So you will miss some of the funny asides that sometimes happen in live shows. Yeah, you'll miss the moment where a park ranger rescued a spider from our table. Yes, that I did not want to hurt. You won't get to hear me talk about how I would fight a witch and win, which was completely unrelated to the episode. (laughs) I forgot that even happened. So uh, if you did not grow up in the Boston area... You may wonder why or why we're pronouncing the name Quincy with a Z in it when Quincy is Q-U-I-N-C-Y. Uh, that is not a thing that I learned how to say by moving to Massachusetts and hearing a local person say it. It's a name that I learned to say by playing Fallout 4, which is, they got that correct in Fallout 4. So, the ancestor who John Quincy Adams was named for and who the city of Quincy is named for pronounced his name Quincy. And so it, these names are pronounced Quincy. It probably shocks people who have said it Quincy their whole lives, but that's uh, how it is. What we are talking about in this episode is really John Quincy Adams as a diplomat. If you're not really immersed in 18th and 19th century Uh, U.S. history, John Quincy Adams probably comes to mind more as the son of President John Adams and then the sixth president of the United States, not remembered as a particularly effective president. But he had a really extensive and influential career as a diplomat long before becoming president. George Washington called him the most valuable public character we have abroad. Uh, One of the books that I read about his diplomatic work leading up to this podcast called him one of 19th century America's most accomplished diplomats and statesmen. And his wife, Louisa, was an important part of his work and really awesome on her own. So that is the show that we're doing today. Yeah. So John Quincy Adams was born on July 11th, 1767, the oldest son of John and Abigail Adams. His parents were, of course, incredibly prominent figures in the American Revolution. And he was immersed in that world basically from birth. He also saw the Revolutionary War firsthand on June 17th, 1775, when he was seven. His mother took him up to the top of Penn's Hill, which was not far from his birthplace, also not really far from where we did that live show. They could hear the cannons and see the smoke from the Battle of Bunker Hill and from the burning of Charlestown. Today, there is a cairn marking the spot where they watched that. And that makes it sound like kind of a fun adventure, but in fact, it was really terrifying. John Adams was away at the time, and Abigail was looking after the children of General Joseph Warren, along with John Quincy and his siblings. And Warren was killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill. Much later, John Quincy described that period of his life this way, quote, For the space of 12 months, my mother, with her infant children, dwelt, liable every hour of the day and of the night, to be butchered in cold blood, or taken and carried into Boston as hostages by any foraging or marauding detachment of men. When he was 10, John Quincy went overseas with his father, who had been appointed the U.S. Commissioner to France. And this was really the beginning of John Quincy's career as a diplomat, Frequently over the next few years, he accompanied his father on various diplomatic missions, and often he would continue his education in schools in Europe while they were abroad. 
In 1781, at the age of 14, John Quincy Adams went overseas with Francis Dana, the U.S. minister to Russia, and he acted as Dana's personal secretary and served as an interpreter of French. This was a really difficult assignment. Russia did not yet recognize the United States as a sovereign nation, so it was an uphill battle for Dana to even be recognized as a diplomat at all. John Quincy also served as a secretary during the Treaty of Paris negotiations at the end of the Revolutionary War. It was only after all those years of experience in the world of international diplomacy that John Quincy Adams finally went to Harvard. He graduated in 1787 at the age of 20, and he graduated second in his class and gave a speech at commencement on the theme of the importance of public faith to the well-being of a community. Later, he was admitted to the Massachusetts bar, and he started practicing law in Boston. But soon, he was right back in the world of diplomacy. President George Washington appointed him minister-resident to the Netherlands in 1794. He was appointed minister plenipotentiary to Portugal two years later. But before John Quincy assumed that role, his father was elected president, and he changed that assignment from Portugal to Prussia. Before going on to Prussia, though, John Quincy Adams stopped off in London, where he married Louisa Catherine Johnson on July 26th of 1797. So we're going to rewind for a minute on, and catch up on who she was. Louisa Catherine Johnson was born in London on February 12th, 1775. Her mother Catherine was British, and her father Joshua was a merchant who had been born in the American colonies. The family moved to France during the Revolutionary War. They were a little uncomfortable in England because they supported the Patriots' cause, so it was a little uh, a little dicey to stay there. Yeah, it would have been awkward. Louisa was also really young when they moved to France, and while living there, she attended a Roman Catholic convent school. She became fluent in French and essentially had to relearn English after the war was over. She had forgotten most of the English that she knew, so once they moved back to England, she had to start over. Aside from all of the international relocation, Louisa had the upbringing that you would probably anticipate for an affluent young woman of the time. Her education had a significant focus on music and literature, although she also really loved science as well. And her teachers indulged her study of science from time to time, even though that was not considered a particularly feminine topic of interest. After the end of the Revolutionary War, Joshua Johnson became the first American consul in London, so Louisa became part of a household that was continually welcoming dignitaries and diplomats, and one of those was John Quincy Adams when he was in London on a temporary assignment. He proposed to her in May of 1796. He was still serving as minister-resident of the Netherlands, and he needed to return there, so he couldn't get married right away. And they kept up their courtship through letters, and that wedding in 1797 finally happened only after a number of delays, some of which were at the urging of his parents, who did not really approve of this match. But as a couple immersed in the world of diplomacy, they actually were pretty well-matched. Both of them became highly respected in diplomatic circles, John Quincy Adams was known for having a very cold, aloof, and stubborn demeanor, which is probably obvious if you have ever seen a portrait of him. (laughs) He looks even more severe than typical portraiture of the time. Louisa, on the other hand, was graceful and witty and charming, and so his aloofness was offset by her charm. She could be really anxious about making a good impression in these aristocratic and royal circles, and she was not always comfortable being in the spotlight. But she made a really quick study of all the various layers of etiquette and protocol that were required of her, She wound up becoming friends with a number of royals and dignitaries, and as the years progressed, she became very good at talking about her husband and framing his work in really positive terms. She basically eased the way for him in all these various diplomatic assignments. Not long after they got married, though, Louisa's father's business collapsed, and she was mortified, and she was also really worried that people were going to think that she had tricked John Quincy into getting married. She really doted on her father, and this bankruptcy meant that her new husband and father-in-law were being contacted by his creditors. She also had to adjust to a much more modest lifestyle. 
John Quincy's salary as a diplomat was really not large. And since her family no longer had any money, she never really got her dowry. She just, they did not have a lot to live on. This was especially true since they were supposed to be moving among Prussia's most affluent and prestigious circles. Louisa really felt like they couldn't maintain the lifestyle that they needed to on the amount of money that they had. John Quincy's work as a diplomat also meant that he was really busy and he was away from home a lot, including during Louisa's pregnancy with their first child, George Washington Adams, who was born in Berlin on April 12, 1801. This was really hard on Louisa. In addition to the usual stresses of pregnancy and delivering and just dealing with a newborn, particularly your first child, she had ongoing issues with her health for her whole life. It's not really something that we can diagnose today, but a range of illnesses and fevers, along with symptoms of anxiety and depression, all were part of it. She and John Quincy would ultimately have four children, but she also, heartbreakingly, had at least nine miscarriages and a stillbirth. After John Adams lost the election of 1800, he recalled John Quincy back to the United States before he left office. Louise's family was living in the States as well by this point. Her father had been made the commissioner of stamps and was living in Washington, D.C., This was a time of mixed emotions for Louisa. She was still recovering from her pregnancy and delivery, so she was really happy to be reunited with her family in her first ever trip to the United States. But she and her husband were going to be spending significant amounts of time in Massachusetts as well. Abigail Adams still didn't really approve of Louisa and John Quincy's marriage, and Louisa really wasn't what was expected of an Adams woman. Abigail Adams was a very take-charge, get-things-done kind of person, and Louisa, in contrast, was the product of a very privileged European upbringing that did not prepare her for things like running a household and a farm. The Adamses and the Johnsons were also just very different families. The Adamses were Unitarians descended from the Puritan founders of Massachusetts, while Louisa was an Episcopalian and had been educated in a Catholic school. She was a little suspicious of the Unitarian Church. She called it, quote, a sect enveloped in a cloud of mist. Especially during this stretch of time in the States, Louisa always felt like she was being judged by Abigail and that she was always coming up short. She greatly preferred being in D.C. over being in Massachusetts. The Adamses were in the United States for the next few years. John Quincy served in the Massachusetts Senate and then the U.S. Senate. He also taught rhetoric and oratory at Harvard. But in 1809, President James Madison appointed him Minister Plenipotentiary to Russia. John Quincy Adams' diplomatic mission to Russia led to one of the more dramatic periods in Louise's life, and we are going to get to all of that after a quick sponsor break. After John Quincy Adams was appointed minister to Russia, he and Louisa moved to St. Petersburg with their youngest child, Charles Francis Adams. At this point, they had three children. Their older sons, George Washington Adams and John Adams II, were left back in Massachusetts in the care of Abigail Adams. And as was the case with a lot of household and family decisions, this one was made without really consulting Louisa. Her relationship with John Quincy seems to have been loving and passionate. Like, when she was sick, he would fret himself into distraction about her health. They seem to have really had a lot of tenderness and affection for each other, but also, unsurprisingly, given that this was a marriage involving an international diplomat who would later become president, their relationship was also frequently contentious. And he didn't often seem to see her as his equal or include her in a lot of decision-making. One of the things that Louisa had really not enjoyed about her time in Massachusetts was the winters, and the winters in Russia were worse. Louisa's frequent illnesses got worse while she was there. And she and John Quincy also had a daughter while they were in Russia. That daughter was also named Louisa Catherine. She was born on August 12, 1811. But unfortunately, she died a little more than a year later, and of course, Louisa was absolutely devastated. John Quincy's diplomatic work in Russia played out in the context of the Napoleonic Wars. Tsar Alexander I had been allied with Napoleon, but once that alliance was dissolved, to put it mildly, he sought stronger ties with the United States. 
John Quincy Adams was one of the people working to try to build those ties and to increase reciprocal trade between the U.S. and Russia. On June 18, 1812, the United States declared war on Great Britain. Tsar Alexander wanted to continue to trade with both of those nations, and he offered to try to mediate with the hope of ending the war. But at that point, Britain was confident that it was winning, and so refused the offer. Yeah, Britain was basically like, yeah, we don't need your help, dude. We got this. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> of course, though, the war dragged on. It had its own shifts in who was winning, its own ebbs and flows. And 18 months later, in January of 1814, both nations finally agreed to peace talks in the neutral city of Ghent. President James Madison made John Quincy Adams head of the commission to lead these negotiations. And he left for Ghent in April of 1814, leaving Louisa and Charles Francis behind in St. Petersburg. For months, John Quincy was in Ghent conducting peace talks, while his wife and son were alone in St. Petersburg. And we should qualify that, that alone also included a household of servants and the tutors that Charles Francis had. But this was still one of the loneliest stretches of all of Louisa's time as a diplomat's wife. The Treaty of Ghent was finally signed on December 24th, 1814, although word traveled pretty slowly and fighting continued into 1815. The U.S. had gotten into this war with the hope of gaining more territory from Canada, but once they got to the negotiating table, John Quincy's primary goal was to just put the two nations' territory back to where it was before the war started. And in that, he was successful. To quote from the treaty... All hostilities, both by sea and land, shall cease as soon as this treaty shall have been ratified by both parties, as hereinafter mentioned. All territory, places, and possessions whatsoever taken by either party from the other during the war, or which may be taken after the signing of this treaty, excepting only the islands hereinafter mentioned, shall be restored without delay." Historians still argue about who really won the War of 1812, if anyone. But to the U.S. government, this treaty was viewed as a diplomatic victory. At the start of the negotiations, Britain had wanted 250,000 square miles of land in the Northwest, plus a new border for Canada that would give it the southern shores of the Great Lakes and part of Maine. And with that possibility in mind, just put it back the way it was was a big win. And we should note that this treaty was catastrophic for the indigenous population in the contested areas. The treaty was supposed to restore, quote, all possessions, rights, and privileges which they may have enjoyed or been entitled to in 1811. But there was no authoritative map of 1811 and what those possessions had been. And also that northwestern land that Britain had wanted was supposed to be used to set up an independent Native American state. And that obviously did not happen. On December 27th, 1814, John Quincy Adams wrote to Louisa. At her encouragement, he had gone to Paris for something of a break after the treaty was signed. He directed her to settle all of their affairs in St. Petersburg, to pack up whatever she wanted to keep, to sell everything else, and to join him in Paris with their son. She got this letter in late January, and she was baffled. As we mentioned earlier, she had often been completely excluded from decisions about their household and their family up to this point. But now he was suddenly entrusting her to manage all of this by herself. He also made it sound like it would probably not be that hard. Um <laughs> Whereas when he had made this same basic journey before leaving, he had made sure that she knew where his will was. After she recovered from her total astonishment in this whole situation, though, Louisa happily got to work. Three weeks after getting the letter on her 40th birthday, she was ready to go. She had some mixed feelings about leaving, but she was very eager to be reunited with John Quincy. So on February 12th, 1815, she started a 40-day, 2,000-mile journey by sled and carriage through Russia in winter. It was literally the same path that a lot of Napoleon's army had been following while retreating because going into Russia in winter is a terrible idea. She was traveling along the post road system, which was really easy to get lost on, and it required her to manage changes of horses at post stations along the way. She and her seven-year-old son were accompanied by two servants, 
every thing that I read about this described these two servants' loyalty as questionable. They also had a governess who was hired on the day that they departed. During this trip, there were only nine days that they were not traveling, and that would have put them on the road in a horse-drawn sleigh or carriage for an average of 10 hours a day. They spent nights in towns when possible and at post stations when not, or they just traveled through the night when there was nowhere to sleep and it was too cold to bunk in the carriage. They also had to keep a supply of food and beverages in the carriage because they never knew what provisions might be like at the more remote post stations. This journey took them through places that had been devastated during the Napoleonic Wars, and a lot of times the soldiers who had been fighting were all still there, either theoretically protecting the peace or pretty much waiting to go to battle again, sometimes just causing trouble. And all of this was on top of the usual threats involved with travel, which also included bandits and highwaymen on the road. When she got to Germany in mid-March, Louisa started hearing rumors that Napoleon had returned from exile. By the time she got to Frankfurt, it was clear that this was not just a rumor and that she needed to get to her husband as quickly as possible. Napoleon was indeed on the move again and terrorizing the very area that they were traveling through. Louisa wrote numerous accounts of this journey, including one in her autobiography, which I love the title of. It was Adventures of a Nobody. And one of these accounts here is how she described her state as they crossed into France. Quote, My health was dreadful, and the excessive desire which I felt to terminate this long and arduous journey absolutely made me sick. I had been absent a year from my husband and five long, long years and a half from my two eldest-born sons, whom I had left in America with their grandparents. War had intervened, and free communication, in addition to the accustomed impediments from the climate, had conduced to add to my anxieties. Every letter had brought me accounts of the loss of near and dear relatives whom I never more should see, and nothing but the buoyant hope of soon embracing those long separated and loved sustained me through the fatigue and excitement to which I was necessarily exposed. Outside of Epernay, very roughly 100 miles, that's like 150 kilometers from Paris, they traveled past a group of camp followers who saw the carriage, assumed its passengers were Russian, and started shouting threats and epithets at them. Soon, they were surrounded by Napoleon's imperial guard, who looked at Louisa's passport and saw that she was an American en route to Paris. The fact that she was fluent in French came in really handy here, but they still only let her go if she would shout, Viva Napoleon! Yeah, she shouted it a lot and very enthusiastically. They were ultimately allowed to go, although the soldiers stayed with their carriage all the way to the next post house. They also threatened to shoot them and generally menaced them with bayonets if they made the horses go any faster than a walk. Charles Francis was terrified, and in Louisa's own account, the next several hours were pretty much a blur. But she finally arrived at John Quincy's rented rooms in Paris on March 23rd, 1815. With the two of them reunited, it seems like another good place for a quick sponsor break. This arduous wintertime journey through Europe shifted several relationships in Louisa's life. Number one, it really clued her husband into the fact that she was indeed smart, trustworthy, and capable. She became a bigger part of his working life after this. It also brought into focus that he'd probably been underestimating women in general. And Abigail Adams finally started warming up to Louisa after this, too. She had demonstrated that she was actually quite hearty. About a month before Louisa arrived in Paris, John Quincy was named Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary to Britain. This was a post his father had held, and it was one that his son Charles Francis would eventually hold as well. Once they got there, the Adamses found a nice little house in the country, and they brought their oldest sons over from the U.S. They spent most of the next two years in Britain until John Quincy was appointed Secretary of State under James Monroe on March 5th of 1817. This was a role that he was highly qualified for thanks to all of that time overseas on various diplomatic assignments. 
His experience in international diplomacy really shaped his work as Secretary of State, and his work as Secretary of State continues to affect the United States in a lot of ways. In 1819, he negotiated the Transcontinental Treaty, a.k.a. the adams onee Treaty, which is what transferred what is now Florida to the United States from Spain. Parts of this territory had long been in dispute, and that dispute was only resolved after the U.S. used Andrew Jackson's campaign against the Seminoles as leverage. And this was another part of John Quincy Adams's career that was viewed as a diplomatic triumph. That one sentence obviously does not do Andrew Jackson's campaign against the Seminoles justice <laughs> at all, but that's a whole other topic. On December 2nd of 1823, President Monroe gave his seventh annual message to Congress, basically his State of the Union address. He talked about negotiations with Russia and Great Britain about their respective rights and interests in the Northwest. And he said, quote, in the discussions to which this interest has given rise and in the arrangements by which they may terminate, the occasion has been judged proper for asserting as a principle in which the rights and interests of the United States are involved that the American continents, by free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintained, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. He went on to elaborate from there with three basic ideas. First, that the United States wouldn't interfere with European colonies in the Western Hemisphere that existed already, but that the Western Hemisphere was off the table for future colonization. Second, if a European power did try to establish colonial rule in the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. would see that as a hostile action against the United States. And third, the U.S. would not get involved in European affairs. These ideas have come to be known as the Monroe Doctrine, and John Quincy Adams was a huge part of its development, The Monroe Doctrine grew in part out of a fear that Spain would try to recolonize South America. At this point, most of Spain's former South American colonies had had their own movements for independence that had been successful. There was a fear that Spain was going to try to take all that back over. Initially, British officials had proposed that the United States and Britain issue a joint statement about this. But John Quincy insisted to the president that the United States should act on its own, in part because teaming up with Britain would just make it look like Britain was doing all the work and the United States was just kind of a hanger-on. So he influenced what the Monroe Doctrine said, along with the fact that the Monroe Doctrine existed at all. The U.S. was not a military superpower at this point. So the idea that the nation could actually enforce the principles outlined in the Monroe Doctrine was almost laughable. So the response from the major European powers was somewhere on a spectrum between dismissive and irked. But the Monroe Doctrine became the cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy and continued to be cited and to influence international relations for a very long time. The Monroe Doctrine was a huge part of John Quincy's legacy as a diplomat, but that was also just one part of it. Through his time abroad and his time as a Secretary of State, he set and reinforced a lot of precedents in U.S. foreign relations, for good or for ill, really, including the idea of freedom of the seas and overall non-intervention in other nations' affairs. He was also a supporter of the idea of manifest destiny, or the idea that the U.S. was destined to spread itself and democracy all across North America, He shifted that opinion a little when it looked like expanding into Texas would also expand the institution of slavery. He was in favor of expanding the nation, but not if it brought slavery along with it. John Quincy Adams ran for president in 1824 in what was a highly contentious election. And Louisa was at the heart of his campaign. She held Tuesday night sociables along with all kinds of other events, and they made extensive connections among Washington, D.C.'s most influential people. Louisa was a gracious and delightful hostess, and she really encouraged her husband to try to be more charismatic in his campaign and shake off a little bit of that cold demeanor. Andrew Jackson won more popular and electoral votes than any other candidate in this election, but he did not have the electoral majority that was needed to win. So the election fell to the House of Representatives. Louisa held her last campaign sociable on February 8, 1825. 
At least 60 members of the House were there, and in a surprise upset, the House of Representatives elected John Quincy president the next day. He was inaugurated on March 4, 1825, and reportedly sworn in with his hand on a book of law. This show is more about John Quincy Adams' work as a diplomat than about his time as president, but just to touch on it, overall, it was not a successful presidency, and it was not a happy time for the family. That contentious election left him without support in Congress. John Quincy also made Henry Clay, who had also run for president, his secretary of state. And this led to accusations that John Quincy Adams had made a corrupt bargain to secure the presidency, something that John Quincy steadfastly denied. As president, he had really lofty goals. He thought the government should be a force for public good, so he wanted to establish a national university, fund a variety of scientific expeditions, start a huge infrastructure project that would include highways and canals. But with a lot of Congress actively working against him, he could not get any of it done. Even though he could be really pragmatic when it came down to actually implementing his more idealistic goals, I mean, he understood sometimes that what he was doing or what he was wanting to do was really ambitious, and he understood that sometimes it was not realistic to get there, The fact that it was just stonewalled the whole way was a huge blow. We mentioned at the top of the episode that this was originally prepared for a live show, and we normally have a rule about live shows that we don't want to do bummer topics. Uh, But the Adams' life at this point really did become quite difficult. They faced ongoing animosity in Washington. At the time, and for almost 200 years after, Louisa was the only first lady that was not born in the United States. And as a consequence, she was subject to intense scrutiny. The pressures of being the first family were also really hard on all of the Adamses. Some of their surviving children had a range of problems during and after these years, including alcohol abuse and drug addictions. Their son, George, died in an apparent suicide not long after they left the White House. And to end the discussion of the presidency on a lighter note, but with the caveat that this is apocryphal. Or at least it could be apocryphal. Right. This is not clear as to how uh, truthful this is. The Marquis de Lafayette gave John Quincy an alligator as a pet during his tour of the United States. And for a while, according to the story, the Adamses kept it in a bathtub at the White House, and then they would show it off to guests who came to visit. After serving one term as president, John Quincy Adams lost to Andrew Jackson in the 1828 election, but he did not stay out of politics for long. In 1830, he ran for a seat in the House of Representatives. He was elected by a landslide and stayed in office literally until the day he died. So we are nearing the end of our episode, so we're going to be summing up about 20 years of legislative work, and obviously we can't do that in great detail in what's left. Uh, But one of the big highlights was his fight against the gag rule. And the gag rule was instituted on May 26th, 1836, and it forbade the House of Representatives from considering anti-slavery petitions. John Quincy Adams was stridently against the gag rule. He and Louisa were both morally opposed to slavery. He called it a great and foul stain upon the North American Union. At the same time, he thought the federal government had no constitutional power to abolish slavery in the states where it existed. Obviously, that is not the whole story of how their lives were connected to slavery or to race. But... John Quincy also found the gag rule to be a violation of the constitutional freedom of speech, and he fought against it from the moment it was introduced until it was finally lifted on December 3rd, 1844. It was also during these years in the House of Representatives that John Quincy Adams defended 39 Africans who had been enslaved and sent to Cuba before embarking on an uprising aboard the slave ship Amistad. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and there is actually an episode about it in our archive. And, as we noted earlier, John Quincy Adams continued to be a public servant until the day he died. He stayed in office after having a paralytic stroke in 1846, and then on February 21st of 1848, he had another stroke while on the floor of the House of Representatives. Later, he collapsed at his desk. He was taken to the Capitol Rotunda and then to the Speaker's Room where he fell into a coma and died 
two days later, having not ever left the building again. Louisa had a stroke less than a year after that, and she died on May 14th, 1852. Congress adjourned for her funeral on the 18th, which they had never done for a first lady before. And both she and her husband are buried at the First Parish Church in Quincy, Massachusetts. So that was uh, John Quincy and Louisa Catherine Adams abroad. We also have some thank yous before I get to the story of why we didn't have the live show to share with you. We want to thank, obviously, Adams National Historical Park. Thank you so much for inviting us. We had a great time. It was the weather. Thank you to the weather for cooperating. (laughs) It was a beautiful day. (laughs) It was a beautiful day. It had been above 90 degrees for the high for more than a week, which is hot, especially in a place where no one has central air conditioning. Um, So I was very glad that the weather turned out to be lovely that day. We would like to thank Jessica Pilkington and Carolyn Kynath from the park. They were the people that we talked to uh, as the most as we were organizing all of this. We'd also like to thank Mark Carey from the Quincy Mayor's Office, who helped us out with the PA system for the show and with spare batteries, which we're going to get to in a second. Thanks to the park also for arranging an ASL interpreter for the show, and thanks as well to the interpreter, whose name I unfortunately did not write down. And thank you so much to everyone who came. You were a great crowd with so many folks who stayed behind to say hello to us. I think that was one of the longest post-show meet and greets that we have had, and it was just a true pleasure. We also for sure have to thank Igor Nikki, which is what it says on the card. I thought she introduced herself as Nick. And Ari for bringing us some beautiful gifts and being really sweet. So in lieu of listener mail, here's what happened. <laughs> whenever whenever we do a live show, I always travel with uh, our digital recorder, cables to connect the digital recorder to a mixing board, the, the power cable, and fresh batteries in the recorder and spare batteries just in case. Uh, normally we try to plug in the recorder, but sometimes, as was the case this time, because we were doing an outdoor show that was being powered by a very long extension cord, we didn't have an outlet available to plug in the recorder. So, with fresh batteries in there, I was like, cool, it's no problem, it'll be fine. We did a sound check, everything sounded beautiful, we went back to the the, the uh, in, indoor location where Holly and I were, like, waiting to prepare for the show, And then when I came out to start the recorder recording for the show, the battery symbol was empty instead of full like I left it. And so I was uh, like, oh, no, this is unfortunate. Um, And Mark Carey from the mayor's office had batteries that were closer by than mine, which were back in my bag. So he went out brought us back this gigantic sleeve of AA batteries. I replaced the batteries. I started the thing recording in. We did the show. When the show was over, I went to turn off and unplug the recorder, and it was already off for mysterious reasons. And it was able to turn back on, and I could see that I had a file there of the recording, so I was quite relieved by all of that. And then I stopped looking at it because... Uh, We wanted to talk to the people who had stayed behind to talk to us after the show. Uh, We told the park staff what weird thing had happened with the recorder, and they said, oh, you're in the Adams Triangle, and told us a number of stories about things that have mysteriously gone technologically wrong with no explanation (laughs) at various other events. So, (laughs) Okay, sidebar, this is the first time hearing about it. Oh, yeah? I missed the Adam's Triangle discussion. I was probably talking with a listener at the time. You were. You had immediately started talking to folks, and I was like, I've got to just worry about this later because (laughs) I I can't stand here messing with a digital recorder while people are waiting to talk to us. So when I got back home and I went to pull the recordings off the recorder, I discovered that the recording from the actual show part of it, not the sound check recordings, was zero kilobytes of data. And I was like, well, this is unfortunate. I cannot do anything about it right now because it's like 9 p.m., so I will save this for tomorrow. Uh, This was all on Sunday. So yesterday, I magically recovered the sound file. I would like to state that I felt like a wizard after doing this. (laughs) Number one, the sound file was exactly 13 minutes long, so that's weird. (laughs) 
Uh, number two, it had a strange feedback on it that had not been there during the sound check and was not there in the sound check files that were still uh, on the recorder. So, since we had 13 minutes of weird feedbacky audio, we redid this show as a studio version rather than subjecting anyone to that piece of the recording. It's kind of a bummer when something like that happens, but in this case, it seems to have been a weird confluence of technical events. Uh, I want to make it clear this is not a solicitation for troubleshooting. I've done a whole bunch of testing with the recorder. We've got it all figured out. (laughs) We uh, have a sense, not a totally explained sense, because the various uh, tests that I ran at my desk yesterday, I was like, I can't quite replicate this. I think I know what happened, but I can't make it happen exactly the same way now. But that's why we have shared a studio version, and that is the somewhat unexplained phenomenon of the Adams Triangle, which is (laughs) apparently causing technical problems at Adams National Historical Park. I had no idea there was a spooky explanation. This is super exciting now. Yeah. So uh, so thank you again to everyone who came out. Thank you again to the park. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, if you would like to send us an email about this or any other podcast or history podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And then we're on all over social media at Missed in History. You can come to our website, which is mistinhistory.com, where you will find show notes for all the episodes that Holly and I have worked on together and a searchable archive of all the episodes we have ever done. You can also uh, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever else to get your podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 